thank you for the opportunity to, to speak today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about conversational language understanding. Just wait for it to come up. Um, actually, it's going to be a bit of a review of, of what are some of the approaches um, that people are doing. Um, but first, I'd like to kind of motivate this area of research and this uh, type of work by giving a demo. Actually, it's a recorded demo. Um, so this first one is me trying to find a, a restaurant in Edinburgh with a view of the castle. Oh. Is there anywhere that has a nice view of the castle? I've heard a review of the outsider saying getting a table with a view of the castle is well worth it if you can. What's it like at the outsider? One review of the outsider said fun, good food and friendly service. Do they have vegetarian options? According to one review, however, the restaurant had a good choice of vegetarian options. Can I pick a table for two people? Sure, let's make a reservation at the outsider. What date would you like this book for? For tomorrow. What time would you like a reservation for? For 7 p.m. Okay, so you want reservations for two people at 7 p.m. on the 20th of June 2018 at the Outsider. I say let's start again. Okay, let's start again. Cool. So, so there, there you could see that I w was able to hone in on a particular restaurant, ask kind of free-form questions about it, and get, get, get satisfactory answers, I think, and then go into booking where I it needed from me um, some information, like how many people, when, uh, as a time and as a date. Um, so just to sort of demonstrate the sort of open questions that you can ask, here's another quick clip. What was that cafe where J.P. Rowling wrote Harry Potter? According to one review of the Elephant House, a lot of cafes say that they are where J.K. Rowling wrote Harry Potter. Does this place have good service? One customer wrote, this place is rather crowded and the service was rather slow. And what's their address? According to Yelp, the address of the Elephant House is 21 George IV Bridge. Okay, can I book a table? Sure, let's make a reservation at the Elephant House. What day and time and for how many people? Uh, cool. So, so that hopefully is some motivation of the type of stuff that we're building uh, uh, Poly AI. Um, I'm now going to sort of go into conversational language understanding, the type of uh, technology that powers uh, these uh, spoken language uh, systems. Uh, what is conversational language understanding? Well, for me, it's uh, some method of deriving a representation, which is then used by a spoken language, uh, spoken dialogue system to decide what to say next. And, and that representation could either be some explicit representation, like uh, the food has to be French, it cannot be Italian, and it needs to be in the King's Cross neighborhood. Um, or it could be something like a vector in a vector space, um, an implicit semantic uh, a representation that's a hidden layer somewhere in the middle of a neural network that's trained on a more end-to-end uh, -end task. Um, I'm going to talk mainly about three paradigms for, for doing language understanding in the context of a conversation. Uh, Slot-based systems, ranking systems, and generative models. So first of all, slot-based systems. So here, here's a dialogue um, in a slot-based domain. It's finding a restaurant in Cambridge. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see the dialogue state, which is composed of slots and values. So at the beginning, they're asking for cheap price range in uh, the central area. And you can see that in the, in the second turn, they can add to their goal. Uh, they can change their goal from food equals Indian to food equals Chinese. And you can have special slot value relation to indicate that they're requesting uh, the phone number at the end. So that, that was an example of a dialogue from the Dialogue State Tracking Challenge. Um, 
which has slots with categorical values. There are three areas, sorry, five areas, three price ranges, and there are m many more uh, food types. Um, but you might be sort of thinking, is that really covering uh, restaurant search in a city? Like, I would maybe ask about the atmosphere, or if there's good service, if they have vegetarian options and stuff, like in the demo. Um, but I'll come back to the come back to that topic later. Ta table reservation is maybe more of an obvious slot. Uh, value domain, where you need to uh, constrain the date, the time, and a number of people. Uh, there, the values aren't really categorical. There's a whole different range of uh, times, for example, and a whole different range of ways to refer to uh, those times. Uh, flights is another example that might be uh, slot value based. Uh, we need to uh, query a database at some point to see if there is a flight from this uh, airport to this airport on this particular date. Um, so how do people uh, track the dialogue state? Well, one method is word-based recurrent neural networks. Um, here, the recurrency is through the dialogue turn. So each uh, step, the network takes some input, which is uh, text or spoken language from, this, from the user. And what the system had just said, uh, it then updates its state internally and then produces a uh, distribution over the slots and values at that turn. Um, so that way it learns to jointly understand the, uh, the latest input and to update its state and then to, to give a new value. And, and then typically you'd have one of this type of model for each slot in your domain. One of the big issues that you come across with the slot-based stuff is that the label space is very sparse. Uh, so in the training, training set, it um, might not contain examples uh, of labels that you will then see in the test set. Um, there are many different food types. And in the dialogue state tracking challenge, there were several food types that didn't appear in the test set. But also, there are lots of different ways that you might specify that you want that type of food. So if you did it naively, you would need an example of each different way for each different type of food. Um, and uh, that would mean you would need a lot of data, which is, you just can't get. So um, one way of dealing with that is what's called delexicalization, which is where you replace uh, mentions of slots and values with some generic tag. So here, all of a sudden, these first three sentences look very similar to each other. Um, and what this allows you to do is to generalize across different slot values. Uh, it allows you to track new values that you've never seen before in training, so long as you can delexicalize. And it also lets you bootstrap to a new domain. So you might have a model that's trained on uh, restaurants. Uh, it might do something for the slot values that are important in browsing hotels. Another way of getting the generalization to deal with the sparse labels is um, uh, is to exploit pre-trained word embedding spaces. So this is a diagram of the neural belief tracker. And the key idea here, it's not super important to understand the, the diagram altogether, but it, it's um, this, this D equals C times R. That means that it's comparing a representation of the context C with a representation of a candidate slot value R. Um, so, so long as you're able to provide a vector for a food type, like say Persian, uh, and a vector for a, a word in your sentence, like Farsi, uh, you hope that in the pre-trained vector space they would be close together, and you'd be able to identify that this was uh, a mention of that slot value, and it would generalize in that manner. Um, so I mentioned the label space. Uh, it, you, when you're developing a slot-based dialogue system, you need data to train the natural language understanding component. Um, there are three main ways to, to get this type of annotated data. The first is just to launch some system and to uh, log the interactions it's having with people and to label the data. Um, obviously, that assumes you have some initial system that you can launch, um, which might be an issue. Also, another idea, number two here, is that you could actually simulate fake conversations. So have a computer talking to a computer in the label space, so in the explicit semantic 
uh, annotation space. And then hire mechanical Turk workers or similar to translate from the labels to natural language, so like real English or whatever language you, you're using. And then you end up with uh, dialogues that are in natural language that are fully annotated. And the last idea is you can do a Wizard of Oz type setup. So you have uh, one worker paired with another one. Uh, uh, what, one worker is playing the part of a user, say, for example, trying to find a restaurant in Cambridge. And the other is playing the part of the system. So they've got all the controls that the system might have. And you just record everything they do. And you end up with uh, fully annotated dialogues. Actually, it gives you uh, some idea of what a human might do in that situation. So it might help you to to train a decision-making component as well. Um, so some of the challenges uh, of slot-based dialogue systems, I think the main one for me is that it can impose a artificial structure on dialogue uh, that's suboptimal. So, I mean, if you were to look at real conversations about restaurants, um, I doubt that you could annotate them with the slot value pairs that are mentioned in, for example, a dialogue state tracking challenge. Um, uh, while it's useful for uh, connecting to APIs and database queries, it's maybe not exactly how people talk. Uh, and in order to really uh, exploit the system and make it useful for you, you kind of need to know what the slots and values it has, what kind of things it can deal with ahead of time. So how do you let the user know, like, we deal with area, but we don't deal with you know, um, the quality of the, of the service at a restaurant. Um, another issue with the large label space, apart from generalization, is that it rec usually the way people deal with it is to factorize the dialogue state into different components and then have a model that tracks or classifies different aspects of, of the state. And that just means you've got a lot of models to take care of, which is an engineering uh, problem. Um, every time you want to deploy something new, you need to check that each model is getting a good enough accuracy and that they all play well together. Um, and also resulting from this difficulty in finding data is that you just don't end up having as much data as you would in other um, areas. And you, know, you can apply machine learning to this task, but um, machine learning excels when you've just got like, millions of examples. And here, um, you're not going to have millions of examples. So the next paradigm in terms of uh, conversational language understanding I'm going to talk about is ranking. Um, I'll explain this in context of the smart reply system, the Paris smart reply in Gmail. Um, there, uh, it's using a model that scores input emails and response, responses together. So it'll give a high score to a response that goes with this email, and a low score to a response that looks random in the context of this email. Um, and actually, that, that score uh, is a dot product between two vectors, one vector that represents the input email and one vector that represents the response. Uh, uh, and those vectors are you know, the, the final hidden layer in some uh, deep network. So there are a couple of reasons why factorizing it as a dot product um, uh, is a good idea. One, one is uh, during training. So if you imagine that um, these x, x and y are uh, emails and responses that go together. So x1 is a vector representation of the first email, x2 the second, and so on. And then, and then y1 is the vector representation of the response that goes with x1 and so on. Then this matrix here is um, the n by n matrix of all possible scores in a, ba a training batch. Uh, it's, it's just a fast matrix multiply away from computing the x and y. Um, we would want the diagonal to be very high for scores of uh, emails and responses that go together to be high, and then the off diagonals be low, which we could learn with a softmax uh, loss. Um, it gives us a lot of uh, signal in our learning. It's very efficient. Um, we'd managed to do like n squared comparisons, but kind of like linear complexity in a way. Um, 
Also, during inference, we can pre-compute all the vector representations of the responses and then just do like a simple search. Um, so here, training data is much easier to collect. It doesn't need any special annotation. Um, we just need pairs of, in this conversational context, this was the response. And we learn uh, what responses are plausible in different contexts. Uh, it's very easy to constrain the output of this because we control the candidate set of things that it's ranking. So we can ensure, for example, that each sentence was written by a human, um, that each sentence has been approved, maybe, um, if you're worried about uh, it, what it can say. And also, uh, a big thing is that it has implicitly learned its representation of meaning. So it's learned that vector space. Um, it wasn't hand-engineered like in the slot-based systems. Uh, instead, it was directly optimized as part of the learning process on the data for the task at hand. Um, so the last paradigm I'll talk about is uh, generative models. So this would be sequence to sequence. The first application of this to dialogue would have been uh, Oriel Vinales's neural conversation model. Um, the idea there is that you train a neural network to encode conversational context and then produce responses uh, word by word in a generative fashion. So here you've fed it how are you and you give it some special transition token and then it generates like a language model, it generates fine uh, thanks uh, word by word. <coughs> So this is kind of how state-of-the-art translation works. You'd feed it, say, French, and then it would output English. Um, but you know, I see uh, translation as a bit more of a, a slightly simpler mapping than the mapping of uh, inputs to responses. Um, and as a result, um, these models, obviously, they just model the data that they're fed. They, they can have this issue of, having, of learning a kind of blurry model over the data so that when you go to generate from them, they will just produce very common responses. It doesn't seem to depend on the input. Uh, so there are special tricks to overcome that. But you know, if you didn't do anything, it would just say, I, I, don't, I don't know, or I love you, or whatever is common in the data. Um, also, of course, this is a complexity that depends with the, on this, the, the sequence length. So you have to run the RNN for each sentence that you're outputting, whereas ranking um, it's sort of just one pass through the network. Um, it's hard to constrain the output uh, in the same way that you could constrain the output for the ranking system. So it's kind of difficult to apply this to a useful task. Um, the demonstration of that might be if you, if you were to talk to this model, if you trained it on some conversational set, you ask it, you know, what's your, what's your name? Uh, it would just come up, it would just sample a name from the distribution of names in the data, like, hi, I'm Bob. Uh, if you asked it again later, there's no guarantee it would be consistent with itself. It come with some other name from the data, possibly. Um, so if you want to train it to have a particular personality or do a particular task, it's difficult. So I'm going to summarize the pros and cons of the different paradigms. Um, first, we had the slot-based systems. It's really good if you want to have explicit structure. Uh, if you need to do a particular API call, like a book a table, for example. However, that structure that you impose can lead to artificial uh, dialogues. Like, who says that that's how uh, people will uh, approach your system? Um, it's an engineered label space, and you don't end up with a lot of data. So for a ranking, you can use a lot of data. Um, you can constrain the output of the system to make sure that it's like human written and constrain it in any other way that you like. And it's learned this implicit semantic space. On the other hand, it's, it's challenging to connect it to an API call. So how, how would you extract um, some, um, some explicit uh, representation in the same way that you can from the slot-based system? So for generative methods, it has the one advantage over ranking that it can generate new sentences. But that's also a disadvantage that it can generate new sentences. If, um, you know, if you're a company that cares about your image and you have an assistant that represents you and it can theoretically generate any possible English sentence, 
there are some obvious issues with that. Um, this uh, issue of domain adaptation is, is kind of tricky. So there, there are ways to uh, tweak your model that's trained on general text to have a particular personality or something. It's very difficult to measure and it's very difficult to get correct. Um, so thanks for your attention. So I'm um, uh, uh, representing Poly AI. We're about we're a new company. We're about twelve people. Two people are in Singapore, including me. Um, we're working on conversational systems. So if it's something that you're interested in, then uh, please talk to me. Thank you very much.